Pan-Africanism, a global movement with deep roots dating back to the Atlantic slave trade, aims to foster solidarity among all indigenous and diasporas of African ancestry. Beyond continental Africans, the movement finds substantial support among the African diaspora in the Americas and Europe as well. The origins of Pan-Africanism can be traced back to the struggles of African people against enslavement and colonization, encompassing rebellions, suicides on slave ships, plantation uprisings, and the Back to Africa movements of the 19th century. Rooted in the belief that unity is crucial for economic, social, and political progress, Pan-Africanism seeks to unify and uplift people of African descent. At its core, Pan-Africanism is grounded in the belief that Africans, both on the continent and in the diaspora, share not only a common history but also a common destiny. Intellectual, cultural, and political movements within Pan-Africanism tend to view all Africans and their descendants as part of a single race or as having cultural unity, central to this ideology is a shared historical fate, revolving around the Atlantic trade in slaves, African slavery, and European imperialism. Pan-Africanist ideals played a significant role in the establishment of the Organization of African Unity, now succeeded by the African Union, in 1963. The African Union Commission is based in Addis Ababa, while the Pan-African Parliament has its seat in Midrand, Johannesburg. Pan-Africanism advocates for collective self-reliance, encompassing both governmental and grassroots objectives. Notable Pan-African advocates include historical figures such as Toussaint Louverture, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, Haile Selassie, Edward Wilmot Blyden, Patrice Lumumba, Julius Nyerere, Robert Sabukwi, Ahmed Seko Touré, Kwame Kruma, King Subhuza II, Robert Mugabe, Thomas Sankara, Kwame Tour, Dr. John Pum Magufuli, Muammar Gaddafi, and Yoweri Kaguta Museveni, as well as grassroots organizers like Joseph Robert Love, Marcus Garvey, and Malcolm X. Pan-Africanist intellectuals like Bois and Antenor Furman have also contributed to the movement. Pan-Africanists believe that solidarity among African nations would enable the continent to reach its full potential and independently cater to the needs of its people. Achieving the Pan-African objective would consolidate power in Africa, leading to a reallocation of global resources and a surge of psychological and political energy that could potentially challenge existing social and political structures in the Americas. Critics of Pan-Africanism argue that it tends to homogenize the experiences of people of African ancestry and face challenges in reconciling current divisions within African countries and diaspora communities. Despite these criticisms, the overarching goal of Pan-Africanism remains focused on promoting unity, empowerment, and self-reliance among people of African descent worldwide. In 1900, the first Pan-African Conference was held in London, marking the beginning of modern Pan-Africanism. However, the roots of Pan-Africanism can be traced back to ancient times, encompassing the historical, cultural, spiritual, artistic, scientific, and philosophical legacies of Africans throughout history. It emerged as a response to the oppression faced by Africans, including slavery, racism, colonialism, and neocolonialism, and embodies the values and struggles of African civilizations. During the late 19th century, as slave insurrections in the New World gained momentum, notably the Haitian Revolution, a transcontinental pro-African political movement emerged with the aim of unifying diverse campaigns against oppression. Ethiopianism, a religious Pan-Africanist worldview, also played a significant role during this period. The Sons of Africa, a political group based in London, advocated for the rights of Africans and engaged in activities such as letter-writing campaigns and addressing meetings, the Pan-African Association, initially called the African Association, was founded in 1897 by Henry Sylvester Williams. Williams organized the first Pan-African Conference in London in 1900. 
This conference marked the beginning of a series of Pan-African Congresses that aimed to address issues of colonialism and decolonization in Africa. Subsequent meetings were held in Paris, London, New York City, and Manchester. The 5th Pan-African Congress, held in Manchester, was particularly notable for its involvement of anti-colonial activists from Africa and the African diaspora, including influential women like Amy Ashwood Garvey and Amy Jacques Garvey. In 1957, Ghana gained independence, and Kwame Krumah became the first prime minister and president of the country. Krumah played a pivotal role in promoting Pan-Africanism and regional integration in Africa. He advocated for unity among independent African states, emphasizing their shared history of suppression under imperialism. The All-African People's Conference, hosted by Krumah in Accra in 1958, brought together political leaders and movements from across the continent, fostering a sense of African nationalist identity and anti-imperialism. This conference marked a significant milestone in Pan-Africanism by uniting Arabic states and black African regions. In 1963, the Organization of African Unity OAU, was established in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, with the participation of 32 African states. The OAU aimed to defend the sovereignty and raise the standard of living of member states while supporting freedom fighters and decolonization efforts. The creation of the African Liberation Committee during the summit demonstrated Algeria's commitment to supporting liberation movements. Algeria played a prominent role in the Pan-African Cultural Festival held in 1969, which showcased the Algerian Revolution and inspired anti-colonial movements worldwide. After the death of Kwame Krumah, Muammar Gaddafi emerged as a prominent leader in the Pan-Africanist movement advocating for African unity and the establishment of a United States of Africa. In the 1994 7th Pan-African Congress held in Uganda, women's issues were specifically addressed for the first time. This led to discussions on women's concerns, such as genital mutilation and the protection of young domestic workers, and the establishment of the Pan-African Women's Liberation Organization. In the United States, Pan-Africanism became closely associated with Afrocentrism during the civil rights movement of the 1960s and 1970s. However, it should be noted that Pan-Africanism historically overlooked the contributions of women, leading to the emergence of Africana womanism in the 1980s as an ideology focusing on the achievements and experiences of black women. The Establishment of the Organization of African Unity now the African Union, in 1963 was influenced by Pan-African thought. In the 21st century, one of the African Union's primary goals is to enhance long-term economic growth on the continent. Notably, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement AFCFTA, was created to address this objective. This agreement establishes a free trade zone that connects nations across Africa, with a combined GDP of over 2.5 trillion US dollars. While the implementation of the AFCFTA has been delayed due to the emergence of COVID-19, the African Union envisions that it will stimulate industrialization, foster increased trade, and contribute to economic integration throughout the continent. The African Union has also aimed to bring about changes in policies related to movement within the continent. Similar to the free movement policy in the European Union, the African Union proposed a policy that would enable residents of member countries to move freely throughout the continent and engage in economic activities in other nations. Although many countries have not formally endorsed the agreement, and some express skepticism about its success, the African Union considers this policy a significant step toward achieving continent-wide solidarity and integration. However, despite living in an era of globalization and heightened connectivity, the African Union faces persistent challenges that hinder its goal of continent-wide solidarity. These challenges include inconsistent implementation of treaties, 
ineffective governance, and ongoing involvement from foreign economic powers. Influences from countries like the United States, Britain, and France continue to play a role, while China and other nations are increasingly becoming politically and economically engaged on the continent, leading to what some refer to as a new scramble for Africa. Bridging the divide then existing among newly independent African countries may not look all that difficult now. However it required the statesmanship of Emperor Haile Selassie I and his pragmatic evaluation of what was possible at the time to get Africans together to achieve what has always been the dream of Pan-Africanists. This historic step lay the foundation for Africa to play a critical role in speeding up the further liberation of the rest of the continent. The people of Ethiopia take immense satisfaction at what their country was able to contribute to African unity and the liberation of the continent under the leadership of Emperor Haile Selassie I. The Emperor's prioritization of the unity of Africans which he thought could only be better advanced when they spoke in one voice was well articulated in the historic speech he made on May 25, 1963. The following was what this great African, about whom Mandela spoke so glowingly in his autobiography, said during that historic occasion. What we require is a single African organization through which Africa's single voice may be heard, within which Africa's problems may be studied and resolved. We need an organization which will facilitate acceptable solutions to disputes among Africans and promote the study and adoption of measures for common defense and programs for cooperation in the economic and social fields. Let us, at this conference, create a single institution to which we will all belong, based on principles to which we all subscribe. We recall, Emperor Haile Selassie I and his country, Ethiopia, had witnessed a five-year colonial occupation that the defiant people drove out of their territory and made history against colonization. Despite Ethiopia being a member of the League of Nations, it was not sealed from colonial aggression, for great power duplicity made it easy to abandon Ethiopia. This must have had a decisive impact on the Ethiopian emperor to seek salvation in the unity of Africans and in commitment to Pan-Africanism to which he remained loyal until the end of his life. The erection of the statue of Emperor Haile Selassie I in the compound of the African Union, the inheritor of the legacy of the OAU, is therefore an appropriate homage to this African leader. Selassie's statesmanship was legendary and his pragmatism helped Africa embark on a long journey towards the unity of Africa, which will be in the interest of all its peoples, a journey yet to be completed. This is a journey which has had many ups and downs and would continue to be full of challenges because Africa still has many mountains to climb and numerous hurdles to overcome. This is the responsibility of this generation of Africans to carry out, thus making sure that the conditions of Africans would be much better than now when the baton is passed over to the next generation. The African leaders of the Emperor's generation did their best to hand over to us an Africa which was much better situated than in the past to fight in unison for the liberation of our people. They did their part to which the contribution of Emperor Haile Selassie I and Ethiopia was indeed monumental. As we celebrate the inauguration of the commemoration of the statue for His Imperial Majesty in February next year, we should all be mindful of our obligation to contribute to the completion of the journey that those founding fathers began, a journey which will continue to be complex and full of challenges, all the more so at present when the global situation is far from being conducive for international cooperation and for revitalizing international partnership. What we see today, contrary to what the world agreed three years ago, was far less readiness to embark on renewed partnership to combat poverty and to leave no one behind. Whether on peace and security or economic development, what Africa is encountering today is very reduced commitment to effective international solidarity with the view to helping Africa address the challenges facing it. 
All these considerations make it incumbent on Africans to enhance their commitment to the realization of Agenda 2063 and to roll up their sleeves and strengthen their unity in the spirit of their founding fathers whose challenges were in many ways different from the challenges we face today. But Africa's future is ahead of us and the effort now being made to reform the institutions of the AU provides hope that Africa is ready to take the bull by the horns and ensure the achievement of real progress for which silencing the guns by 2020 is of paramount importance. In all these the further strengthening of the unity of the continent in a pragmatic manner and the way Emperor Haile Selassie I approached the challenge is a lesson from which we should all learn and for which we should remember the Ethiopian Emperor. The commemorative statue will indeed serve as a reminder of this and the other accomplishments of Emperor Haile Selassie I, the concept of Pan-Africanism, originally introduced by Henry Sylvester Williams, though some attribute it to Edward Wilmot Blyden, initially referred to the unity of all African nations. During apartheid in South Africa, the Pan-Africanist Congress, led by Robert Sabukwe, focused on combating the oppression faced by Africans under apartheid rule. Other Pan-Africanist organizations include Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League, TransAfrica, and the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement, Pan-Africanism is also seen as an effort to return to what its proponents view as traditional African concepts concerning culture, society, and values. Examples of this include Leopold Cedar Sanger's Negritude Movement and Mobutu Sisi Siko's promotion of authenticity. A common theme in Pan-Africanist literature emphasizes the historical connections between different African countries and the benefits of cooperation as a means of resisting imperialism and colonialism. In the late 1960s, some universities established departments of Pan-African studies in response to the civil rights movement. These departments, such as the one at California State University, focus on teaching students about the African world experience, highlighting the richness, diversity, and vitality of African, African American, and Caribbean cultures, and providing an Afrocentric analysis of anti-black racism. Syracuse University also offers a master's degree in Pan-African studies. Pan-African colors, the use of green, yellow, and red as colors in the flags of various African states and Pan-African groups can be traced back to the flag of Ethiopia in 1897. Ethiopia, being the oldest independent nation in Africa, served as the inspiration for this color combination, making it a visual representation of Pan-Africanism. The UNI, Universal Negro Improvement Association, flag, adopted in 1920, consists of three equal horizontal bands of red, black, and green. This flag has been utilized by several countries and territories in Africa and the Americas to represent black nationalist ideologies. Examples include the flags of Malawi, Kenya, South Sudan, and St. Kitts and Nevis. The red, black, and green color scheme is frequently employed by Pan-African organizations and movements in various contexts.